One day I was sitting in Australia, in a desert. The land was red. I was next to an old man, an old Aboriginal man. And after we gazed in the horizon, after a few minutes, he looked at me and he said, Hey, little one, you be careful. And I look at him a bit, wondering about what's going on here. You be careful who you tell your story to, because this is the most precious thing you will never own. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my world. It's a really important night tonight. We need to connect and feel connected. I invite you to come with me in my life's journey. Let's go walking. So, that start actually here in the States. I had this amazing idea, like I saw this little trail called PCT. I had no idea what was going on there. I read was an amazing journey going from the northern part of the States in the Canadian border, crossing all the west and reaching the Mexican border. I thought, this is for me. Right. Let's do this. Anyway, I'll start my journey in the Canadian border. In May 2000, I come from the mountain, right? So I know about snow a little bit. Anyway, I, I thought May it's a good time, you know. I start walking, not knowing much about the bear story, because I thought it was a horrible story out there about bears, grizzly bear. I thought, I better do that on my own way, so I do not get scared. Right, I start walking in those deep forests. And I had my plan B going on, you know, I thought, if anything goes really wrong, I just jump on the tree. This is a good plan. Anyway, I keep walking over the days, and I look at the, I look at the tree, they had this funny mark on the side of the, of the tree, and I thought, what is this, this thing going on there? And I saw this huge cloud mark. I thought, holy, holy, holy cow. Those things climbing, you know. I can see this mark on a tree. I thought, oh, this is going to be a tough one. Anyway, a few days later, I climb a summit full of snow. And unfortunately, the weather changed. This cold front became a really hot front, really warm front going on. And that was my first time I nearly find death. I was on this slope going like really, really, really like that on the lateral way of the mountain. Suddenly, I feel my legs going like that and the snow falling down. The avalanche was nearly taking me. I had this surviving skills of running uphill, find this big rock, hiding behind the rock. And I've been staying there for six days. Well, I survived, right? That's all matter, really. So I did what everybody would do, wake up every day at 3 o'clock in the morning and testing the snow. One day, that snow would be hard enough for me to go on. I did exactly that. But first mistake, I didn't have all the topographic map. You know, you've got a trail, you follow the trail, so you've got the trail map, right? But this is wrong. You always have to have a plan B. If anything goes wrong, you need, to go, you need to know what's going on around it. So I didn't have those maps. So I follow a green valley down the hill. I arrive there, and after a few days, finally, I reach like a little car park, and this old woman was there. She looked at me and she, ah! I was like, oh, what's going on? A bear somewhere or something. And this woman looked at me like she saw the devil in me. Her husband ran. She said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, are you all right? I said, I'm just fine. He said, are you sure? I had second degrees burn on my face. And my old face was a big blister who actually were falling down. A piece of skin was falling down my face, but I didn't care about that. I was just about surviving. Anyway, the story goes on. So I get to that little village. I was starving. I get into the first pub, and I start to eat my fish and chips, you know. First plate, second plate. On my second plate, the police come behind and say, Miss Marquis? I say, uh, 
Mm, yeah? Come with us, please. Did you walk through those land there? So, well, I just get off the mountain, it was dangerous, yeah? You walk on FBI land. <laughs> like, well, there is, I didn't know that. There was some snow everywhere. Well, well okay, so he gave me a ticket, and it was like a $5,000 warning. Like, if I don't get out of that Washington state in 48 hours, I will get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, plan B. Anyway, I make connection, I flew all the way down to San Diego and started to get walking from the Mexican border this time. <laughs> I thought, that's going to be safe. Well, safe kind of, because I had, uh, at that time, uh, the Mojave Desert in the front of me in full July. It's a bit more complicated. Anyway, I finished this incredible journey. I can go on all night about this journey because it's been really incredible. We save a guy in a river, nearly dead, John, and uh, he survived after a long journey of running away from the, from the guy for two days to get help in this uh, really remote area. But all went well, I finished. And then back home, I had my mind. It was like if I opened a little door inside my mind, I had to win. I had dreams, big dreams, and I had this dream of Australia. What's about if I start in the middle and I go all around it and finish in the middle? It's like a 14 month journey, 30 kilometers a day, 14,000 kilometers. And I just did that. I start after one year preparation. After three months, I met my dog, Joe. He was in a farm, not really happy. I stole the dog, ran away with the dog. <laughs> Arrived in a forest, completely exhausted, out of breath. I was like, okay, I've got a dog. <sighs> Let's do this. Talk to the dog, I say, well, we're gonna walk together, right? We're gonna do 10,000 kilometers together. He looked at me and said, yes, I'm in. <laughs> and we took off and we had this amazing journey. I finished my expedition with him and I bring him back to Switzerland. He is a wild dog. Uh, it's half dingo, half uh, red healer. And he survived and he lived until he was 17 years old in the snow. So just two weeks before the end of this expedition, I walk in a place, a special place, um, an Aboriginal community. Anyway, I had a bit of a health problem there. I wake up near a fire pit, and I, all I can hear was I was like, right, this looks interesting to me. And I was like, what's going on? They, ha they saved me. I just collapsed in a dune, and they saved me. And they accept me in the community like they own. I had a mum, this is my mum. I've got sisters, and what happened? We go hunting together. And I was like, oh yes, I can go hunting with them. Imagine what I'm going to learn, because I was hunting myself. So I was, when I was hunting, I was hunting like that, you know, just try to make no noise at all. And just try to be one with nature. Well, it didn't work really well. I was, I was hunting with those women, and they had, they've got this big butt going on, you know. And you can see them moving through the landscape, and they were talking to each other. They're online, and they're like, <laughs> I'm moving there, but, but suddenly, <laughs> one lizard, one goanna. I was like, what? I didn't see anything. They were yelling at each other. Well, I make the point that I'm going to follow her from behind all the way. I did that for a long time, never find her trick. She knew where the lizard, the goanna was, and where to find food. Those people got this amazing connection with nature. You would never believe how connected they are. And from the day one, it was a bit of a problem, me be there, you know. So what happened is uh, they decide to marry me. Yeah. They marry me to George. One morning, I realized that I was married. How cool is that, right? 
No, no wedding preparation for months and months. You just married like that. And uh, I said, can I see my husband? <laughs> you know, innocently. Which one is it? <laughs> and she pointed this guy behind a tree out there. He was cross-legged with a painting he was painting. His name is George. He was 80 years old. <laughs> so the young woman, they used to marry them with the old one to make the community quite stable. But those people, those Aboriginal people, for me, it was it. That was it. That was my family. That was my place. That was the, where I belonged to, you know. Everything was so natural, so pure, in, in a lot of ways. For me, that was the answer. And one day they say, well, you know, everybody's got a totem. So some, some are uh, the kangaroo, some are the emu, some are the snakes. And uh, they give me a totem and they say to me, oh, uh, you, you are a uh, jabiru. I say, a uh, jabiru? What is a jabiru? You know, oh, it's a bird. I was like, wow, I'm a bird. I'm a beautiful bird. I'm so happy. I was so proud, you know, like, what can be better than a bird, really? So this is the bird. <laughs> the most ugliest bird I never see. So, but they were, they were not that wrong. Look at the legs, long legs, big nose, right? Anyway, I finished my expedition. I finally walk away from, from my family, this family. And I promise myself, if I walk away from here, I have to talk, I have to communicate with the world about this possible connection with nature. And that's what I start doing as soon as I get home. I start writing and giving conference. Then, meanwhile, I was doing this. I had this wild dream. I, I saw one of the little story about those Inca people during the Inca Empire, where they were running on the top of the Andes. And I thought, what? What's going on there? And I've been, been doing some research, and had this wild expedition start. I planned to walk from Santiago de Chile, the capital, all the way following the Andes, go through Bolivia, arriving to Peru, and then go up the Machu Picchu. Well, I did just that, eight months of a really surprising journey. And to arrive in Machu Picchu in one piece, really skinny, well, I lose a lot of weight, and I get arrested by the special forces there, too, after three minutes on Machu Picchu. But I made it. So with the help of my brother, my little brother, we were really a big help at that time because he did resupply pond all the way through because there is not much food and water on that expedition. And then I had this relaxed time in Switzerland, you know. I've got time between two expeditions where I just breathe, you know, and live. And so I was going to my little grocery store. And it's a little organic store where I go to buy all my stuff. And um, I had all my bags and get out of the shop, try to cross the road. There was too many cars going on. And I thought, OK, I put my bag down and um, just look around a little bit. Turn around and I see this little travel agency behind me. And this big picture there, massive picture, green picture. It was like a Mongolian step. You can actually feel drawn into the picture was so green. Like, I was like, wow. Anyway, went home, didn't think about it. Then this picture grew in me, and I started to search about Mongolia. Then, wow, the Baikal Lake is not far from it. Siberia. And then south of it, you've got the Gobi Desert, right? And then if you go south, it's China. Amazing China. And then Laos and Thailand. And then if you, you've got a bit of water, but then you've got Australia. Well, I just, I just did that. I built this incredible expedition. Two years preparation to walk from Siberia all the way down to Australia. Took me three years. 
Well, it didn't, didn't, you know, things happen on the way. We, we, we're going to see what happened. What, when an expedition really starts, it's, it's not everything as you plan, you know. Mongolia has been surprising. I needed to start three times to go through Mongolia. Two, it's not enough. Don't, don't, don't take no for an answer. Never do that, you know. A first no, it's a good, safe no. And a, a first no, it means you're not on the right door. You've got few other doors to go in. And really, the Gobi Desert and Mongolia was about that. How determined I was. This land not going to let me go through the first time. And I hope I own my passage there. Because every step I was doing, I was not following a trail. I make my own trail. I make my own reality. One step at a time. Took me three years, though, you know. Take a bit of time, but... Imagine, you can go around the world on foot. Imagine. The thing is, you can do this, but you have to know how your brain works a little bit. You know, if you, if you tell your brain, right, you know, I'm going to go around the world on foot, it's going to say, yeah, right. You know, sit on the couch, watch TV, relax, have a drink. You, you will see, you forgot about this idea later on. So don't let your brain, your little computer, make funny decisions for you, right? You need to be on charge in this one. Your dream, it's the most important thing that you can have. Well, how big is the dream? Go for it. But it's one step at a time. So I reached, three years later, this little, tiny, amazing tree. Look at this picture. So that was a tree that I met on my uh, Australian journey between 2002 and 2003. I met that tree. I make a promise to that tree. I said, darling, don't worry. I will be back. And when the idea of finishing my expedition where I could finish my expedition. And my team was saying, well, Sarah, you're going to finish in town, so we can, we've got the media, we've got the TV station coming in. I said, no way. We're going to finish there. It's in the middle of nowhere. And I finished exactly near my train. 